One of the great things about being a retro gaming enthusiast is the prospect of revisiting your old failures. You can return to the scene of the crime, vanquish that age-old demon that bested you in the past, defeat what once seemed impossible. You can proudly say, yes, yes, I am smarter than I was when I was eight. And that's really why I played Ultima Quest of the Avatar for the NES, a deep-seated 25-year-old grudge. Well, that's not entirely true, but let's not put the cart before the horse, shall we? Quest of the Avatar was released to US audiences in 1990, hot on the heels of Final Fantasy. As its name would imply, it's an entry in the venerable Ultima series, and a port of the Apple II PC game Ultima 4, Quest of the Avatar. Presumptively, the 4 was dropped from the NES release in order to avoid scaring off consumers unfamiliar with prior entries in the Ultima series. A similar path was taken with Ultima 3, Exodus, which was ported to the NES as simply Ultima Exodus in 1989. When I first encountered Quest of the Avatar back in elementary school, its size and scope left me floored. It offered a degree of freedom and a sense of mystery that was almost oppressive. It seemed like just simply far too much for my young mind to tackle. Right from the onset, you're thrown into a vast open world with virtually no limitations on your ability to explore it. Portals allow you to travel the globe instantly. Feel like crossing the sea? Beat up some pirates and take their ship. Hell, there's even a hot air balloon that's more or less accessible from the get-go. The world in Ultima is yours. You can even randomly murder small children and old men. Even modern games don't let you take it that far. But what is it exactly that you're trying to do in Quest of the Avatar? That's not exactly clear from the beginning. You kind of have to ascertain it from dialogue with strangers all over the world. Or from the liberal hints in the game's manual. Or, perhaps, if you're lucky like me, from the notes your older brother scribbled on the game's map back in 1990. But, in any event, the mission you're tasked with in Quest of the Avatar is so big and so nerdy that even recounting it makes me feel like I'm about to get a wedgie from some kid on the bus. But anyway, here goes. As Ultima opens up, you're dropped into a tarot card reading session, where you'll respond to a bunch of hypothetical moral scenarios in order to determine your character class. If you're lucky, you'll get a spectacularly powerful magic wielding champion of justice. If you happen to be a particularly decent person, however, you'll probably wind up as a powerless shepherd marooned on an island filled with poison. That is not hyperbole. After you've settled into your class, you'll quickly learn that there's no big bad guy to beat in Quest of the Avatar. You play the role of an individual randomly summoned to the mystic realm of Britannia. Britannia is ruled by a gentleman by the name of Lord British, a surrogate for the game's eccentric creator, Richard Garriott, who is concerned that his subjects are generally less than virtuous people. In order to rectify this, he has summoned you, the player, to his realm to become a paragon of virtue, to master the eight virtues of avatarhood, compassion, honesty, valor, honor, sacrifice, justice, spirituality, and humility, and to lead his people to a bold new age of reason. In order to do this, you must travel the realm of Britannia and be just generally awesome, telling the truth, giving money to beggars, overpaying blind merchants, not running from fights, questing for legendary items, talking to everybody, no matter how awful they might be, giving blood, and just otherwise not being a jerk. As your quest progresses, you'll periodically check in with Hawkwind, a fortune teller named after an early English prog rock band who will tell you when you've become master of any of the eight aforementioned virtues. However, simply being a decent human isn't enough. In order to truly master a virtue, you'll need to meditate at that virtue's shrine. But you just can't get into a shrine and meditate, oh no. You'll have to find a rune which will grant you access to that shrine. Those runes are hidden everywhere from random horse troughs to blazing furnaces for no apparent reason whatsoever. Once you have obtained a given virtue's rune, you must enter that virtue shrine and meditate at the face of an Ankh. This process must be repeated eight times until you have achieved avatarhood in each virtue, thus becoming Britannia's messiah. However, your quest does not end here. Oh no, beneath Britannia lies a vast interconnected series of seven dungeons, each of which is named after a negative virtue which roughly corresponds to one of the game's principal virtues. In those dungeons, you'll find a series of colored stones. Each of those stones corresponds to a color the game has assigned to the virtues. Red for valor, white for spirituality, etc. and so forth. Once you have these stones, you'll need to learn about the principles of virtue, love, truth, and courage. Each of these principles is made up of four virtues. Love, for example, is made up of compassion, sacrifice, justice, and spirituality. You'll learn all about these principles by traveling the land and talking to a series of citizens and sages who serve no purpose other than to generally espouse knowledge about how to live decently. Once you've learned about these principles, you'll need to travel to the bottom of the underworld where an altar room for each principle awaits. In each altar room, you'll have to place the stones which correspond to that principle's virtues onto an altar and pray. 
Completing this will give you one third of the tripart key, which will grant you access to the Stygian Abyss, where you, for unarticulated reasons, must travel to obtain the Codex of Ultimate Knowledge. But three keys isn't enough to get into the Abyss. Oh no, of course not. You also need to traverse the country looking for four artifacts. The Skull of Mundane, who is the antagonist from Ultima 1, though you wouldn't know this without reading the game's manual, the Candle of Love, the Book of Truth, and the Bell of Courage. After you've obtained those items, you'll need to travel to the mouth of an active volcano, and ring the bell, read from the book, and light the candle. This will cause the Skull of Mundane to crack, which for some reason will give you access to the Stygian Abyss. Once in the Abyss, you'll have to answer a series of trivia questions about how the virtues match up with colors and principles, fight an army of evil clones, and finally read the Codex of Ultimate Knowledge. Then, and only then, can you claim to be the savior of Britannia. Congratulations, you are now awesome. Now, now that I think of all of this, I'm amazed that I had the patience for this as an adult, let alone as a child. Well, I guess I really didn't have patience for it as a child, that was the whole point of this. But conquering the mysteries of Britannia is a strangely rewarding experience, even with all of the liberal hints sprinkled throughout the game's documentation. It's pretty amazing to consider that the Nest port is supposedly infinitely less complex than the original Apple II slash PC release. And perhaps that complexity is why Quest of the Avatar isn't remembered alongside Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest in the pantheon of Nintendo role-playing games. But I find that that obtuse nature is also what gives Ultima its charm. While Quest of the Avatar could be accused of having poorly defined goals, there's simply so much stuff to do in this game that you rarely feel lost. There's treasure, secrets, and hints to be discovered around every corner. As I played through the game, I found myself excitedly scribbling down notes every second. The game's designers, both the original developers and the folks that ported it to the NES, placed a remarkable degree of trust in the player to just figure it out. And to be frank, that's something that's just missing from other NES RPGs of the time. Not to mention RPGs today. And I think that's why it's my favorite NES era RPG. And to be fair, Ultima has other flaws as well. Combat is remarkably simple, and there are some glaring localization errors which have no business being in a game that was originally designed in English. But the game's sheer breadth is damn near unmatched on the NES. And for what it's worth, the game looks a lot better than its 1985 home computer source material. So if you're hankering to play an 8-bit RPG but are looking for something a little bit different, I'd strongly suggest you take a look at Ultima Quest of the Avatar on the NES. It was open world before open world was cool. Just make sure you have a pen and some graph paper handy. Those dungeons are pretty tricky. Until next time, this is Steve White, Avatar of Virtue, for Subspace Briefcase, signing off.